Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson will be on the next flight of its Spaceship 2 suborbital vehicle, going to space days before the fellow billionaire Jeff Bezos. The company announced on July 1 that the mission named Unity 22 could take off as soon as July 11, depending on weather and other factors. With this launch window, the flight may happen just before Blue Origin's launch of its new Shepard suborbital vehicle, scheduled for July 20. The mission will mark the fourth crewed test flight of VSS Unity, a spaceplane that launches from a carrier aircraft mid-air and ascends toward the edge of space. After reaching the apogee, the spacecraft will perform a slow turn and then glide back into Earth's atmosphere, landing on the same spaceport America runway where its flight began. The duration of the flights will be approximately 2.5 hours, though only a few minutes of that will be in space. The flight will have pilots Dave McKay and Michael Masucci at the controls, both of whom have previously flown Spaceship 2 beyond the 80-kilometer altitude. In the vehicle's cabin will be Branson and three Virgin Galactic employees. In addition to Branson, the crew consists of Chief Astronaut Instructor Beth Moses, Lead Operations Engineer Colin Bennett, and Vice President of Government Affairs and Research Operations, Sarisha Bandla. They will test the vehicle's cabin in preparation for future flights of tourists and researchers. This will be the 22nd flight test for VSS Unity and the first ever to carry a full crew of two pilots and four mission specialists. Two more test flights remain this year before Virgin Galactic carries out its first revenue-generating mission for the Italian Air Force. The company has about 600 reservations for paying customers on future space flights, with each ticket going for around $250,000. Virgin Orbit, the sister company of Virgin Galactic, successfully launched a payload of satellites to space on Wednesday for its debut commercial mission from Southern California. The mission, dubbed Tubular Bells Part 1, marked the third flight of Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 spacecraft since May 2020 and the debut of its commercial satellite service. The carrier aircraft, a modified Boeing 747 aircraft named Cosmic Girl, took off on June 30, flying westward toward the Pacific Ocean. Less than an hour later, the 21 meters long two-stage Launcher 1 rocket dropped from the plane's left wing and ignited its single engine to zoom toward the edge of Earth's atmosphere. Launcher 1 is a two-stage air-launched vehicle designed to carry small sat payloads of up to 300 kilograms into sun-synchronous orbit. The rocket has a diameter of 1.6 meters for the first stage and 1.3 meters for the second stage and payload fairing. The first stage of the rocket is powered by a single Newton 3 engine capable of producing 327 kilonewtons of thrust. The second stage of the rocket is powered by a Newton 4 engine, which can deliver a maximum thrust of 22 kilonewtons. Both the stages use RP-1 as fuel and liquid oxygen as the oxidizer. On Wednesday's launch, the rocket carried Netherlands' first military satellite, four tiny satellites from a Defense Department test program, and the first two of 14 imaging satellites for Sat Revolution's constellation. After separating from the first stage, the rocket's second stage executed what the company calls a barbecue roll, where it does a little spin to expose all sides to sunlight, evenly heating the spacecraft as it carries the satellites toward orbit. Nearly two hours later, Virgin Orbit confirmed that all seven payloads had been deployed as planned into their target orbits. Wednesday's mission will be followed by at least one more mission in October of this year. The missions will proceed a much busier launch schedule in 2022. Ariane Space lofted another batch of OneWeb broadband satellites on July 1 in a milestone that will allow the company to begin providing internet access. OneWeb, the company headquartered in London, is a global communications company building a capability to deliver broadband satellite internet services worldwide. On Thursday, a Soyuz 2.1B rocket lofts the OneWeb satellites into orbit from the Vostochny Cosmodrome in Siberia to begin a nearly four-hour mission delivering the 36 satellites to orbit. The mission, called OneWeb 8, was the eighth OneWeb launch since the first satellites went up in 2019. A frigate upper stage mounted on top of the Soyuz rocket completed the task of placing the OneWeb spacecrafts into orbit. The upper stage deployed the satellites in nine groups of four during a process that took nearly three hours to complete. It will take about a month for the satellites to raise themselves to a near-polar orbit of 1,200 kilometers, where they will then beam connectivity back to Earth. Thursday's launch increased one web constellation to 254 spacecraft, and the company can now begin providing internet coverage in far northern latitudes. OneWeb aims to launch a total of 648 satellites to offer high-speed internet connectivity to customers around the world by 2022. Meanwhile, Indian telecom company Bharathi Global is set to own the largest share of OneWeb after investing an extra $500 million to complete the constellation's funding.
Bharati and the British government jointly bought OneWeb out of bankruptcy for $1 billion in 2020, rescuing the startup in the middle of the COVID pandemic that had disrupted its funding plans. The recent investment of an additional $500 million gives the Indian group 38.6% of the company. Bharati Global's investment means OneWeb has secured the $2.4 billion it needs for deploying 648 satellites by 2022, providing connectivity to enterprise, government, maritime, and aviation customers. Spacecraft that venture beyond our moon relies on communication with ground stations on Earth to figure out where they are and where they're going. To calculate the trajectory of a distant spacecraft, engineers send signals from the spacecraft to Earth and back. But for robots on Mars or more distant destinations, waiting for the signals to make the trip can add up to tens of minutes or even hours. If those spacecrafts carried atomic clocks, they could calculate their position and direction, but the clocks would have to be highly stable. NASA's Deep Space Atomic Clock is a technology that is working toward giving those far-flung explorers more autonomy when navigating. Managed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Deep Space Atomic Clock has been operating aboard General Atomic's orbital test bed spacecraft since 2019. The spacecraft was launched atop a Falcon Heavy rocket on 25 June 2019. One of the key goals of the Deep Space Atomic Clock mission was to measure the clock's stability over longer and longer periods to see how it changes with time. In a new paper published on June 30 in the journal Nature, the mission reports progress in their work to improve the ability of space-based atomic clocks to measure time consistently over long periods. In the new paper, the team reports a level of stability that leads to a time deviation of less than 4 nanoseconds after more than 20 days of operation. As a general rule, an uncertainty of 1 nanosecond in time corresponds to a distance uncertainty of about 30 centimeters. Some GPS clocks must be updated several times a day to maintain this level of stability, meaning GPS is highly dependent on communication with the ground. The deep space atomic clock pushes this out to a week or more, thus potentially giving future spacecraft and applications like GPS much more autonomy. The deep space atomic clock mission will conclude in August, but NASA announced that work on this technology continues, and the deep space atomic clock 2, an improved version of the cutting-edge timekeeper, will fly on the Veritas mission to Venus. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Six weeks after assembly began, SpaceX has completed Starship's second full-scale Super Heavy Booster prototype, Booster 3, and rolled it out of its high bay on July 1. Standing approximately 70 meters tall, Super Heavy Booster 3 is the same height as an entire two-stage Falcon rocket and is expected to single-handedly weigh six times more than a fully-fueled Falcon 9 when loaded with propellant. After arriving at the launch site on Thursday, workers rapidly installed the rocket on the suborbital launch pad A. As you can see, the booster is equipped with composite overwrapped pressure vessels and electrical and plumbing lines required for the upcoming test campaign. The ground tests of Booster 3 were expected to begin as soon as Tuesday, but the cancellation of road closures scheduled for July 6 and 7 indicates that the tests will delay a few days. Check out our previous video to learn about the set of ground tests through which this booster will go through during its test campaign, link in the description. Speaking on June 30, Elon Musk revealed that Booster 3 was very hard to build and this particular booster will not fly. Instead, the booster will undergo ground tests intended to pave the way for its successor to launch on the first orbital test flight of the Starship system. According to him, we can expect rapid design evolution in the first 10 Super Heavy boosters and the first 30 Starships. He pointed out that the booster will not perform an entry burn during re-entry, as its velocity will be comparatively lower than that of a Falcon 9 booster. This is because the change in velocity required to achieve orbit will be shifted more to the Starship. He added that maximum dynamic pressure and heating during booster re-entry would also be lower than a Falcon 9 booster. When asked about SpaceX's increased focus on mass reduction and super heavy compared to Starship, Mr. Musk replied that SpaceX has already done a lot of iteration on Starship, and for rapid reusability, the booster must return to the launch pad, so inert mass impacts the flight. He added that the booster flight rate is approximately five times that of the Starship, and refurbishment required between Starship and super heavy flights is zero. Meanwhile, Starship serial number 20, which will be launched atop Super Heavy Booster 4 during the first orbital test flight, is taking shape at the build site. For the first time, SpaceX sent a vacuum-optimized Raptor engine to the Starbase rocket factory last week. This engine will be installed on Starship serial number 20. Raptor vacuum is a variant of Raptor engine, with an extended regeneratively cooled nozzle for higher specific impulse in vacuum conditions. 
The vacuum version of the Raptor, which has a thrust-to-weight ratio of 120, can produce a maximum thrust of 1,900 kilonewtons. According to Elon Musk, the vacuum variant of the Raptor has a specific impulse of 378 seconds, which can be increased to over 380 seconds with some improvements. For an orbital flight, Starship requires three vacuum-optimized and three sea-level Raptor engines. Out of this, three sea-level Raptors have already been sent to Starbase and are awaiting installation. Along with engines and stainless steel ring sections of SN20, the common dome of Booster 4 was also spotted at the build site last week. Recently, Elon Musk tweeted that SpaceX is planning to stack the first orbital-class Starship on an orbital booster by the end of this month. This means the orbital test flight will happen as early as September. Moreover, recently, SpaceX applied for FCC permission to allow Starship and its Super Heavy booster to communicate with Starlink during the rocket's first orbital launch attempt. Previously the company has flown Starlink antennas on Starship serial number 15, and the application asks permission to operate six similar terminals on the upcoming orbital flight. The requested period of operation starts on August 1 and ends on October 1. This hints that it is highly likely that orbital flight will occur in September. Of course, beyond Starship and Super Heavy, SpaceX also has a great deal of groundwork left to get the rocket's first orbital-class launch facilities partially operational. Only then will SpaceX be able to attempt Starship's first space launch. Speaking at the 2021 Mobile World Congress held in Barcelona last week, Elon Musk stated that SpaceX is going to do its best to complete Starship's first orbital launch attempt in the next few months. So we're, we're hoping to do our first uh, orbital launch attempt in the next, um, next few months. Um, and we we'll certainly will have a booster and a ship, uh, an orbital capable booster, and an orbital capable ship, and the uh, orbital launch site will all be ready within the next uh, month or so. Even though Elon Musk is optimistic that the first orbital flight will take place in a couple of months, SpaceX currently doesn't have an orbital launch license, and the company only possesses a license for suborbital flights. Before a license can be approved, the FAA needs to conduct an environmental review of the launch site to ensure launches won't have a significant negative impact on the surrounding area. Speaking about the environmental review, we have an update on the warning that SpaceX received from a district attorney in Texas. Last month, in response to a complaint from Save RGV, a non-profit environmental advocacy group, the district attorney of Cameron County sent a letter to SpaceX warning that the company could be violating several state laws by shutting down public beaches for extended periods and using unlicensed security guards to ward people off public roads. In a response letter to the warning, SpaceX claimed that a county prosecutor might have been fed misinformation that led to certain misunderstandings regarding certain facts. In the letter, SpaceX stressed that the company is required under federal regulations to protect its sensitive technology from unlicensed individuals and that the company must take critical security measures to prevent trespassers from entering SpaceX property and from taking unauthorized photographs of sensitive equipment and operations. SpaceX mentioned the security guard who interacted with the district attorney's staff had only recently been hired, and he did not fully understand the important distinction between providing security and access to the public roads as compared to private roads. Through the letter, SpaceX made it clear that the company respects the right of the public to use public roads and has trained its security personnel on the importance of not obstructing the road outside of permissible county closures. Regarding the complaint that SpaceX has exceeded the 300-hour permitted road closure per year, the company clarified that they had closed the road only for a total of 226 hours and 9 minutes this year, and the allegation that SpaceX has already used 385 closure hours is not accurate. Moving on to other Starship updates, on June 28, the seventh segment of the orbital launch tower got transported from the build site to the launch site. Three days later, in the morning hours of July 1, the seventh prefabricated segment got installed atop the sixth segment, increasing the tower's height to 140 meters. The eighth and final segment of the tower is under construction at the production site. This segment is shorter than the previous seven segments. Workers completed the installation of cross beams connecting the legs of the orbital launch mount last week. Once the work on the orbital launch table is complete, the structure will be transported to the launch site and will be installed atop the launch mount. At the build site, SpaceX is testing an interstage mechanism that is used to connect Starship and Super Heavy Booster. During stage separation, the interstage mechanism will activate to separate the Starship from its booster. A spring-loaded piston cylinder mechanism can be used to unlock the Starship from the booster mid-flight. 
SpaceX has already begun the construction of Starship serial number 21. The thrust dome of SN21 was spotted at the build site last week. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.